If you're like me, you've pushed it, you've stabbed it, you've jabbed it, you've punched it. Of course, I'm talking about that door closed button on the inside of the elevator. We finally get into the elevator after an extremely long wait, pushing the up button six or seven times, and now these stupid doors refuse to close. Sound familiar? I think King David, in our Old Testament lesson, would have been one who pushed that closed door button had they had elevators in, in ancient Israel. David was a go-getter, a doer, a type A biblical personality. Just prior to our scripture lesson today, David, the doer, brought the Ark of the Covenant into the city, to the new capital, to, to Jerusalem. Brought in the presence of God, the, the divine favor into the new capital, into Jerusalem. David is a great hero who rose from rose to power from a mere shepherd boy to become the king. In addition, David was the hunk. He, we, when we first meet David, we hear that he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. Men and women alike could not keep their eyes off him. He charmed, charmed the king Saul. He charmed the king's son, Jonathan, his the king's daughter, Michal, fell head over heels in love with David. He even charmed the king's servants as they drooled over the way he, he strummed the lyre. Women nearly swooned when they saw him and shook more than their tambourines at the mere mention of his name. He was greatly intelligent, always four to five moves ahead of everyone. He exuded testosterone, he slew a dragon, he wrote poetry and sang songs, and he had an aura when he spoke, an aura of authority. King David, he had it all. Two guys drove into a lumber yard in their pickup truck. One of them walked to the office and he said, we need some four by twos. And the man said, don't you mean two by fours? The fellow thought for a moment, said, well, let me, let me go check, let me go check. And he went back out to the truck. He came back in a few minutes and said, yeah, two by fours, we need two by fours. The guy said, all right, how long do you need them? And he thought for a minute, said, well, let me, let me go check. Let me go. So he goes back out to the truck. And um, after a little bit, he came back and said, well, you know, we're going to need them for a long time. We're building a house. David salvaged the fledgling institution of, of, monarch, of the monarchies uh, started by his predecessor, Saul. He brought together the various tribes of, of the Hebrews more solidly than Paul ever had. Not only does he unite the nation, but he also brings the sacred symbol, the Ark of the Covenant, into Jerusalem, into the new capital, making it the center of worship as well as the capital, as a center, center of governance. He brought in divine favor. He brought in the presence of God into the new capital. Now, imagine then the preacher, Nathan, gets word from David, the doer, to come over. And Dave, David tells him something like, Look, preacher, I, I finished building my 15-bedroom house with its multiple bathrooms and in-ground swimming pool and three-chariot garage. God has blessed me real good and I not only built my home because no more nomadic life for me. We're at rest from war. And I've put to rest all the, the external threats from our enemies. So now I'm ready to build God a house. He doesn't mention the fact that he's a little bit nervous having the ark, the symbol of divine favor and presence kept in a tent. 
a mobile home, so to speak, that any skillful rebel might hitch to the back of their SUV and cart it off. And now they would have the claim for divine favor, threatening the stability of the realm. He continued, it's time to build a big church here, preacher. Come on, look at these preliminary drawings I had draw up, drawn up and see what you think. Well, Nathan's first reaction was like any preacher when they get the suggestion of a large gift to the building fund in the church or the temple or the synagogue or the mosque. That sounds great to me. Good idea. Fine idea. Not doing my priestly duties in a tent anymore, a drafty tent. No more tying flap, tent flaps down or tripping over tent stakes. Just think real doors and walls and decorations, a real golden, I mean real golden opportunity. Then Nathan had a dream, or turns out for the preacher, a nightmare. God spoke, Nathan, go tell David thanks, but no thanks. Tell David that he is not going to build me a house, but that I will see to it that his house will always reign over Israel. Did you catch that little play on words by the storyteller here? Building versus dynasty. I, your God, will secure your stability of your realm, not you. But how do you tell the king to cool his jets? How do you go to the charismatic, forceful, persuasive, closed-door button-pushing David and tell him that there is something that he may not do? There is a task that he is not destined to finish. Prophets are in the business of delivering unwanted news. So Nathan goes to David to tell him that God does not want him to build him a holy house. But that task will go to his son. David, God says, that you're done. All the building you need to do right now. Take a break. Leave the continuation of your legacy to me, to God. So how does this type A king take the news? How, how does he deal with the, the frustrations of his plans? What does he do with all those blueprints? Amazingly, David takes the news very calmly. He, he prays a prayer of thanksgiving to God for for the good fortune he has and for the promises that have been made. He does not look for the closed mouth button on the, the prophet's cloak. He does not explode in rage about being in charge and being king and being able to do whatever he wants to do. Do you know who I am? No, he accepts that he has done enough for now and prays for God's blessing. David was willing to stop the rush and take the break. In our gospel lesson today from Mark, the disciples of Jesus had come back from being sent out to work in teams to announce the kingdom of God being at hand. They were tired but excited, filled with stories and, and exhaustion. And here's what Jesus said to them. He said, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. Followers of Jesus then were a lot like us now, coming and going, hardly getting a chance to grab a bite, let alone rest. Jesus tells them to take a break, to slow down, to rest a while. Perhaps resting a while is not simply a lifestyle option. Perhaps it is critical for us living in this hyperspeed, ramped up world. Maybe vacations are not just a nice perk, but, but essential. 
there is, so I read, a serious resurgence of Sabbath keeping going on as as people discover the benefits of of breaking out of this workaday world and devoting a day to reflect, to relax. Bill Parent, a, a Roman Catholic priest and also a long distance runner, reported an almost universally recognized training principle is that a runner becomes faster by taking a day off from his training each week. The Sabbath principle, he observed, is built into our physical bodies. Our society with its smartphones and tablets and laptops and whatever else they've got on your wrist or whatever, so that we can take our work home with us at night and on weekends and even on vacation. They do not realize the need for rest. They do not see that we cannot always accomplish everything. Does not care that we need to rest. Disciples of Jesus today should recognize the need for the deserted place. It's a place of ease. It's a the deserted place is a timeless space, a, a place in which long books can be read, epic movies can be watched, deep thoughts can be pondered. It's a place of rest, of relaxation, of renewal, silence, and, and inspiration. We set ourselves up for trouble if we refuse to take a break to as Jesus says, come away and rest. As the psalmist told us not many weeks ago, be still and know that I am God. The danger here is that we get so wound up, so wound tight that we're not able to be our best selves. Robert Fulgram tells the story of a neighbor, actually, two of his neighbors. One of his neighbors is a man who's obviously successful. In this, in this portion of his history, uh, he, he drives a, a brand new Range Rover, a vehicle built for high adventure, adventure, even though he only drives it to the wilds of downtown Seattle. The man always seems to be late, in a hurry, always harassed and hassled and frazzled. On one particular morning, Fulgram was leaving his house when he saw his type A neighbor leaving his. His neighbor was carrying a, a golf bag, a gym bag, a raincoat, an umbrella, a coffee cup, a sack of garbage for the dumpster, and his briefcase. There were two little, little pieces of toilet paper stuck to his chin, from a hasty encounter with his razor and a frown upon his face. It did not appear that the morning had been going well. But he, but he had his, ta his talisman of success, his, his briefcase made with the purest unblemished belting leather with solid brass hardware. Probably there was a, a name plate on there somewhere with his initials and silk lining inside. Uh, a heavy item in every sense of the word. The neighbor lady, two doors down, the businessman and Fulgram hit the driveways about the same time. The push the door close button man makes no small talk as he loads his SUV for the day's adventure and revs up his engine like he had the pole position at the Indianapolis 500. Uh-oh, though, and by the way, that's the name of the book, uh-oh. Uh-oh, he has put his coffee cup and briefcase on the roof of his Range Rover, and there they remained as he drove away. The neighbor lady, a social worker from the local church, is right behind him in her eight-year-old, just get me there and back, please, God's Ford sedan. She begins to beep her horn, which the man ignores because he's already on his cell phone. But she is persistent. And he finally hears her and in disgust flings down his phone, leans 
out the window and displays a rather impolite single-digit gesture with his left hand to the lady. But, but she's on a rescue mission and continues to honk the horn and waving for him to stop. Fulcrum close behind in his 1952 GMC two-ton go-ahead-and-hit-me truck added his ahooga, a horn he acquired from an old Model A Ford, just for fun. This proved enough, or <laughs> really too much. Um, the man jammed on his brakes, flung open his door, uh, and tried to get out of his SUV without unlatching his seatbelt. At the same moment, his morning cup of coffee slides off his roof and bounces across the hood and smashes on the street. And this is immediately followed by the, the brass-bound briefcase, which takes the paint off as it crashes on the hood and slides and flops onto the street on top of the broken cup of coffee. The dear lady, mission completed, coast slowly around the scene of the accident, smiling, waving, singing, have a nice day to her neighbor, dangling from the car in the clutches of his seatbelt. At this point, I want to carefully quote Fulgrim. He says, and no, she did not, as you might anticipate, run over his briefcase. No, no, she did not, but, but I did. Fulgrim reports this man does not speak to them, but his wife smiles and waves. He is unhappy that his neighbors cost him time and money. Fulgrim concludes he's not a bad he's not a bad guy. Like me, he takes on too much, more than he can handle sometimes. Like me, he gets confused about what's important. I see myself in his mirror. It's less embarrassing to talk about how he runs his life than talk about the cartoon quality of my own. We both need to recall the words uttered long ago. What does it profit a person if they gain the whole world but lose their own soul? Be still and know that you are not God. That you, were, that you were created with the need to, as Jesus says, come away and rest. And, and even if you were God, I, I, I point you to Genesis uh, chapter 2, but the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from all his work. And then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. One overlooks the Sabbath principle at their own peril. The Sabbath, like the other commandments, was made for us and for our benefit. So come away and rest in Jesus' name. Amen.